Today we're brewing up one of my favorite kinds of dark lager, a Munich Dunkel. The way this lager yeast worked out, it actually really pushed the malt through, not only in the flavor, but also in the aroma. I get like a really rich maltiness. It's a perfect beer to accompany like some grilled meats, and it's perfect for this time of year. This is a beer that I have not made in a very long time, about five years in fact. Uh, and I've had a lot of people that have come up to my old video that I made on it in like 2019 and be like, hey, you gonna make this beer style again? And yes, I absolutely am. And here we are today brewing it up. It's gonna lager through the end of winter and be ready for the beginning of spring. I think it's a great beer to crack into when the weather's just a little bit snappy outside still, a little bit crisp and cold, but not necessarily uh, too cold that you can't sit outside and enjoy a beer. So the recipe construction on this one actually shares a lot of similarities with the German Bach. Um, so you have a base that's not made up only of Pilsner malt as a base malt, but also Munich malt. Many people often think of Munich malt and treat it as a specialty malt. Uh, and in some degrees that's true because you are layering it often over some other base malt to get the desired breadiness character into a beer. However, Munich malt absolutely could stand on its own as a base malt. It has enough diastatic power to convert other specialty malts in the grist, although not nearly as much as Pilsner malt or pale malt or any other standard base malt. Before we jump into the recipe though, I do want to thank a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, where you can find all the ingredients that you need for this batch of beer on their website, and also Clawhammer Supply, who manufacture the system that I'll be brewing this beer on. I'm using their 10 gallon, 240 volt system, although there's many other configurations you might be able to use for yourself. For the grain bill in this one, uh, as I said before, it's a pretty uh, high amount of Munich malt going in as our base malt, really. Uh, so the largest amount of it is four pounds of dark Munich or Munich two uh, going in. And then we have three pounds of pale Munich or Munich one going in as well. Then we have two pounds of Pilsner in there to get us the remaining uh, diastatic power that we need to get us down to an appropriate final gravity for the beer style. Then we're adding half a pound of melanoidin malt because I could do a decoction mash on this one, which would increase the melanoidin character and really increase the amount of uh, kind of authenticity that it has. However, I'm electing not to because I have a brand new kid and this is actually going to be an overnight mash and I'll talk about that later, uh, but ain't nobody got time for a decoction mash when a kid's around. Uh, so we're gonna sub in half a pound of melanoid malt to help us get that character. And then we're also gonna do half a pound of Carafa Special 3. Carafa Special 3 is a very intense de-husked roasted malt, which means that you don't get the astringency that you'd otherwise get from the husk of the barley being on the malt. Uh, however, what we're going to be doing with this particular ingredient is actually adding that in at the very end of the mash. This is a trick that I did with my Czech Dark Lager and I do with many other dark styles. This limits the amount of roasted character and roasted flavor that you will get out of the malt, but gives you all of the color. Uh, the idea out of this is that I get a deep red to a dark brown beer out of it without having any sort of roasted astringent character. This should be all almost entirely just like deep, dark bread crust, um, but no real roast. Hops in this beer are really simple. We're just adding half an ounce of Magnum at 60 minutes for about 20 IBUs. Uh, and then this is optional, but I like to add this sort of thing in to most of my lagers. One ounce of Hallertau Mittelfru at uh, 10 minutes, which is gonna give us about five IBUs. So the overall IBUs are quite low at about 25, uh, but you wanna keep that balance in there because we have a pretty strong amount of rich breadiness in there. We gotta kind of balance that out a little bit, keep the beer quite drinkable. For the yeast in this beer, I'm using a classic for this style of beer, Weiss 2206 Bavarian Lager. Uh, this is a great yeast strain. I've used it plenty of times before on a Vienna Lager, on a Schwartz beer, on, uh, I think I did an Oktoberfest with it. I've done many, many different malty lagers with it, and it's one of the best lager yeasts I've found that really pushes that malt in a nice way that's not overpowering. For the water profile in this one, we are gonna be using a relatively light water profile. A lot of people, when they're brewing Munich lagers, really think that the Munich water profile is the way to go, like the default one. The default Munich water profile actually usually has a really high level of bicarbonates in it, which is generally a good thing when you're brewing a dark lager like this, but traditionally, Munich brewers actually boiled most of their water before actually brewing with it, which precipitates out much of that bicarbonate. 
Also, the other brewing minerals in the Munich profile are really high as well. I don't want this to be really minerally. I think you don't need that in this type of beer. It needs to be soft. It needs to have good malt expression. Uh, the cleanliness, the crispness of the lager yeast will take care of everything else uh, and elevate this beer forward. So I don't think that we really need very high levels of minerals. Plus, I'm starting with reverse osmosis water, which is always going to have a very low level of bicarbonate in it anyway. So we'll throw a little bit of baking soda in there to bump that up, but this is what we'll be doing. We are aiming for a water profile of 51 parts per million of calcium, zero parts per million of magnesium, 35 parts per million of sodium, 52 parts per million of chloride, 56 parts per million of sulfate, and 86 parts per million of bicarbonate. Uh, to get that water profile, I am adding in three grams of baking soda, three grams of calcium chloride, and three grams of gypsum. Uh, that is pretty much all we need to worry about for water. I've made several Munich lagers in the past with a much heavier, more minerally water profile, and I have not preferred the way they come out, to be completely honest. I want to see what happens when I make a Munich lager with a much lighter water profile and see if I like that more. For the mash on this one, um, if you've been watching my videos recently, you know I have a busy life, I have a kid um, that requires a lot of attention and a lot of time. So because of that, I've tended to kind of do a lot more overnight mashing. Now, traditionally with this lager, you're gonna do a decoction mash or you're gonna do a step mash. Usually the single infusion method's not used all that much, but it can be certainly successful in this style. That's not what I'm doing. I'm still doing a step mash. Uh, so we're gonna be doing an overnight step mash because I figured out how to actually hook up the Blickman Brew Commander to my claw hammer supply system by swapping out the thermo well and making it fit the right way. Uh, I will link that thermo well down in the description box if you're curious about that. But what this allows me to do is actually program in the step mash the night before, heat the water up, mash in, hit go, have it automatically go through the steps, and then it will just hold that last temperature until I wake up in the morning. Just like the other beers that I did where I did an overnight mash, the next day I'll just wake up, I'll go downstairs, pull out the grain basket, we'll fire it up to a boil, we'll conduct the boil, knock out, chill, transfer to the fermenter, pitch the yeast, and then we'll go clean the next day. Um, it, it's a really good system that works really well for saving a lot of time uh, that is involved in brewing. That being said, if you don't have the ability to step mash and you're stuck using a single infusion method, I would recommend a temperature of 150. Uh, you want this to be a little bit lower because that Munich malt is going to really bring out a lot of uh, intense kind of richness. This temperature should get you a good balance between drinkability and extraction of uh, fermentable sugars in the wort, especially when you're using that Munich malt, that's going to be a little bit tougher. So uh, a good long 150 degree rest should get the job done for you. Anyway, guys, this is a pretty fun brew day. So let's go ahead and jump into it. I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon, 240 volt claw hammer supply system and it started to heat that up to the mash temperature, the first step, uh, which was 148 degrees Fahrenheit. As this was heating up, I milled out all my grain and I measured out my water salts. I added the water salts into the water as it was heating up and once it had reached that target first step temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill minus the Carafa 3. At this point, the step mash had been programmed, so I went ahead and I hit the play button and let it step through everything overnight. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning of the video is that I actually set a fourth step on this one of a lower temperature. So once the mash out was completed at 170 and all the enzymes were denatured, it would actually step back down to about 158 degrees uh, just to avoid any additional astringency that could get picked up from holding at a high temperature overnight. The pump was also shut off the entire time this was taking place. I took a quick sample of the wort to confirm my mash pH and it came in at about 5.15, uh, which is a little bit low, but that's honestly fine for a lager. Typically, they run a little bit more acidic, so that was fine with me, and I left it overnight. I came back the next morning, and I immediately added my Carafa 3, mixed it in thoroughly, and let it steep in the hot wort for about 15 minutes before removing the grain basket and letting the basket drain for another 15 minutes while I brought the temperature of the wort close to a boil. Thank you. 
once I hit that boil, I added my 60 minute hop addition for bittering, which was half an ounce of Magnum, and then let the boil continue for another 50 minutes, where I added in a 10 minute hop addition, which was one ounce of Halletauer Mittelfruhr, and then I also added in a Warflock tablet and some yeast nutrient at 10 minutes as well. I let the boil continue for 10 more minutes, then conducted a quick whirlpool to coagulate all the hops and trube in the center of the kettle before chilling. I chilled in a single pass through my counterflow chiller into my brew build X2, and at this point it was acceptable to pitch if it was an ale. However, this is a lager, so I wanted to make sure I was at the right temperature, and I used the glycol jacket to bring the temperature of the wort further down to about 50 degrees before pitching and leaving it to ferment at 50 degrees. I also pulled a sample for an OG measurement at this time, and I found it to be 1051, which was exactly on target, so that was awesome. So for the fermentation on this beer, we are going to go ahead and do this traditionally. Um, you can do this beer many different ways. You can pressure ferment it if you want to with a regular lager yeast. You can use a clean neutral ale yeast if you want to do a pseudo lager. Same thing can be done with a gvike like Lutra. You can also use a quick lager method on it if your heart so chooses as well. However, because this beer is going to a competition, because it's going up against other really, really well-made beers, uh, I'm going to do this the old-fashioned way. We're going to pitch in uh, standard lager yeast, ferment it at a standard lager lager temperature of 50 degrees for about two to three weeks probably because lager yeast really likes to take its time. It will cold crash that beer, dump the yeast out from the conical, and then actually lager it, keeping it at a very cold temperature for another several weeks on top of that. When I made my Czech dark lager, that was easily the best lager that I have ever made, to be honest with you, and it was a phenomenal beer. And it was actually made with patience, and patience really works well when it comes to lagers. You can pressure ferment, you can quick lager all you want, all that stuff, whatever you do to ferment the beer is fine but there is no substitute for long-term cold storage of a lager. That is the only way to get it to be crispy and clean. You can use filings to help you out with that. There's no issues with that whatsoever. However, the longer you let that beer sit in roughly freezing temperature conditions, the better it is going to be, plain and simple. So bottom line is I highly encourage you to please actually lager your beer. Actually let it sit store for a really long time couple weeks to a month or so before you drink this thing and your patience will be rewarded. If you're going to stick with a lager method like me, and I recommend you do, uh, for alternate lager use, if you can't find Y-East 2206, um, I would recommend White Lab Southern German Lager. I would recommend Y-East 2308 Munich Lager. The Oktoberfest blend that they're still selling right now is actually really good for this type of beer style as well. Diamond Lager is a good dry alternative option as well. So any of those things should get the job done. And of course, if anybody else is making Munich Dunkels like crazy, please let me know what your preferred lager yeast is down in the comments below. And that's about all I got for fermentation, but overall, I just wanna stress, don't rush this fermentation, especially if you're doing it with the true lager yeast and you're doing it in that traditional way. It is worth your time to wait on this thing, and the longer it goes and sits, the better it's going to taste overall. Um, so just be patient with it, give it several weeks, give it a month or so, uh, and then eventually it's going to start pouring crystal clear, and eventually it is going to taste so crisp, so clean, and so rewarding. So I just encourage you to do that part. Primary fermentation for the beer only took about seven days, and I saw a final gravity of 1010 uh, on day seven, and then confirmed that several days later. However, this didn't really mean that the beer is completely finished. It still had plenty of work to do to clean up any additional flavors from that fermentation. So I left it in the fermenter on the yeast for another week before transferring into a keg, cold crashing in the keg, and then lagering long term uh, for about a month, close to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, leaving it in there to drop the yeast out and uh, become clear and crisp itself up. After about a month, my patience was rewarded. The beer is called Voicht Meine Wurst, and it comes in at 5.4% ABV and 28 IBUs.
It is pouring a beautiful dark brown color with red highlights. It is actually completely crystal clear, but the beer is so dark that's actually hard to tell. Uh, so I poured a little bit into this taster glass to show you the true color of the beer and its clarity. For what it's worth, the color of this beer is actually quite dark for a Munich Dunkel. Uh, it's actually almost verging on the color of a Schwartz beer. It pours with a tan head on it that actually has really, really tight construction. Um, it is not pouring a very large head, but it is certainly uh, sticking around for a long time and is working out quite nicely. All right, so let's go in for aroma. I'm actually really happy with the aroma. It's very rich, it's very malty. You get most of that contribution of the German Munich malt in there. Um, and it tells you right off the bat, this is gonna be a very malty beer, but also one that tastes and feels authentic. The way this lager yeast worked out, it actually really pushed the malt through, not only in the flavor, but also in the aroma. And it worked out nicely. Let's go in for mouthfeel. The mouthfeel in this one, it is absolutely crisp. Now crisp is really the trendy word for lagers now, but it, it's true, it, it, that's how it feels when you have it properly lagered. It's been sitting in my keg close to freezing for about a month, and then I raised it up to a serving temperature of about 36, 37 degrees, and it is actually really, really quite nice. That time in the keg drops out all of the sediment, drops out all the yeast. As you can see, it was perfectly clear, but it also affects the mouthfeel and it creates a very light, satisfying, crisp feeling that encourages you to really take another sip. Because of the low amount of minerals in this, I don't have any sharp edges. It's soft, it's delicate, but it's still extremely drinkable. Um, and I really, really like that. Whether you like it or not, the only way to really get that crisp mouthfeel is to leave it in the keg, lagering at close to freezing for as long as possible, as long as you can stand it before you drink it. And then finally, let's go in for flavor. Mm. This is not quite what I think a dunkel should be, but it is still an absolutely delicious dark lager. And we'll get into the details on that in a minute. But first, what do I get? I get like a really rich maltiness, a really powerful, and distinctly German feeling beer in this one. You get that melanoidin character, and that's the melanoidin malt. Even though I didn't do a decoction mash, it still worked out really well, and this is how it works. You get that beautiful maltiness out of this. You get that rich honey base, that, that nice, delicious, like dark honey out of this one. And then you're getting like a really strong cereally character with a touch of a little bit of a sweetness from that Munich malt. There's no caramel flavors in this, there's no abject sweetness in this. I abstained from my usual Cara Munich one edition, and I'm glad I did actually, because it makes it feel a lot more light. It's not as, as strong and thick and caramelly and heavy as sometimes these beers can be, and I'm glad I did it that way. I would not change that. It's just the beautiful character in the malt that makes this so satisfying, and the effect of this is that the beer tastes like chewy and full, despite not feeling chewy and full, as it shouldn't, because this is a medium strength lager, it shouldn't be full, and it's not. The body on it is light and drinkable, but the flavor is really powerful, and uh, it's something that's just quite tasty. There's like a touch of that dark sugar uh, contribution there, because there's a little bit of residual sugar in here, it comes through nicely, Due to that lagering process, the yeast doesn't get in the way. It comes out really, really subtly and nicely on the finish. Um, and overall, just really, just a delicious beer. It's so malty, it's so delicious. It's not over the top, it's not overpowering, and it's perfect for this time of year. You have enough maltiness and richness to carry you through the colder kind of sweater weather that I'm dealing with right now. In a few weeks though, it'll be 70 degrees and sunny, and it's gonna be fantastic even then. It's a perfect beer to accompany like some grilled meats or something like that. It is. It is awesome and it's a great companion to have while grilling as well. The last piece of flavor on this beer is a little bit out of style um, and that is my fault entirely. The Carafa edition on this beer is about twice the size that it needed to be. Uh, I think it's like close to 5% if I remember my recipe. It should be closer to like 2.5%. 
The reason why it was higher for me is because I wanted a darker beer, and I was thinking that if I did it that way, and then I added those dark malts at the very end of the mash, we wouldn't see or taste a uh, significant dark malt contribution, and I was a little bit wrong. Now, Carafa Special 3 is really coming through as a very light, um, not subtle, but light, roasted kind of character. I get like that barbecue roast. Um, the same kind of thing you might get out of like a Rauk beer. It's very smoky in its character and its presentation and it's balanced and it actually works really well. It just trends this more towards a Schwartz beer than a Dunkel. However, it works. It works well. And so like don't let my description dissuade you from brewing it in this way. It just might not be in style for a Dunkel. I like it. I think it really gives this like a depth and like a little bit of a, a character that you don't get from your typical Dunkel. Um, and it gives the, that dark color that's really quite nice, but it's not really too style. And that's really the only thing I think I would change about it. The YU 2206 is really, really good at getting that maltiness pushed to the forefront and then otherwise getting out of the way. I have no yeast flavor. I have barely any hop character in this. It's just all a symphony of malts and it is quite delicious. And at around 5%, it's perfectly drinkable. You can have a few of these and it doesn't knock you on your butt. So it's quite nice and it's perfect for this time of year. Honestly, like the only thing missing from this equation is a mountaintop view. It's like, I feel like I could be drinking this beer at the cafe on top of the Zugspitze. It wouldn't take much for me to just close my eyes and imagine I'm there. Again, the only thing I think I would change about this beer is just having that uh, Carafa edition. Bring it down to like two and a half percent tops um, and that will get you a lighter colored beer, but it still should taste just as delicious and get you enough color to still be considered a Dunkel. But even if you make it use in the same proportions I did, this beer is still fantastic. It's one of my favorite lagers. It brings me so much joy to drink this, and it's such a great reward for sitting around and waiting for the stupid thing to drop clear and lager out over that period of time. But that'll bring us to our close. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit that like button, especially if you learned something. Please subscribe to the channel for more content like this. I'm continuing to brew. I'm continuing to put out more stuff. It's been a little bit of a hiatus, but I am doing my my best to keep the content coming out and uh, I'm having a good time with it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below and of course if you want to support the channel please consider picking up a t-shirt or a sweater which uh, can include this design and many others in the merch store which you can find in the description box down below. I also have a Patreon and Patreon support is where I fund my production upgrades. So the production upgrades that you're seeing not only in this video like this new lens, but also in the future is all due to Patreon support. I've had a ton of production upgrades that I've worked on over the last couple weeks and man, it's making a huge difference and I'm really happy to be using this new gear. So thank you patrons for that support. If that's not your thing though, I also have channel memberships and there's also the super thanks button, which you can hit very easily and quickly. And those things also go back into helping the channel. I have an Amazon store where you can find the production equipment, but also you can find uh, any brewing equipment that's available on Amazon that I actually use on the regular. If it's, uh, if it's available, it's on that store and you can find it there. So check it out if you got some free time. That's in the description box as well. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on social media as The Apartment Brewer, and that's going to be on Instagram and Facebook. So check those links out for some more frequent and uh, continuous content that's a little bit easier to produce than YouTube videos. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you for watching the whole video. I, as many of you know, I have a baby daughter and she is wonderful, but definitely impacts the amount of time that I'm able to invest in YouTube and getting these videos out to you. So they are a little bit more precious. The time that I have is a little bit more precious. So if you're watching the whole video, that means that everything I'm doing is valuable to you and it means the world to me that you're watching the whole thing. Regardless, if you're still watching it at this point, this one goes out to you guys. And I will catch you all in the next one. So until then, prost.